A second example of these um, applications of second order differentials with respect to this time introducing that damping factor, we have a 204 pound motorcycle operated by a driver that weighs 180 pounds. Um, when the rider mounts the motorcycle, the suspension compresses four inches and then comes to rest at equilibrium. So suspension offers damping equal to 240 times the instantaneous velocity. And what we're interested in is the equation of motion of the suspension after the motorcycle lands a jump. And let's assume that T equals zero is when the bike hits the ground. Um, when it hits the ground, we have a downward velocity of 10 feet per second. So we're going to model the, um, the suspension um, with respect to the frame, which is going to be the point of equilibrium, because when it's at rest, it is parallel to the frame. And then we're going to graph the equation and interpret the equation of motion. All right, so let's get to it. We know the total weight. We have the rider and then we have the motorcycle. So we can say the weight, which is really going to be the force, is going to be equal to 204 plus 180 and that's our 384. Um, and then we know that force equals ma, so we can find the mass really quickly. So that's going to be 384 is equal to mass times acceleration due to gravity, which is going to be 32 feet per second. And when we compute that, that's going to work out to be 12. All right, so we get our m is equal to 12, so we're going to hold on to that. <coughs> we need a spring constant, okay, so f equals kx, so we know 3d4 is the force. We don't know what k is. If we were going, if we knew what k was, then we wouldn't even have to bother. And in this case, x is going to be how far we are stretched beyond equilibrium. And we are stretched beyond four inches um, when we exert the force of 384 pounds. Now, four inches is really a third of a foot. All right, so that's one third of a foot. So four inches out of 12 inches is going to be a third of a foot. So we're going to say multiply that by a third. And we're going to multiply both sides by 3, and that gives me 1152 for k. And then the only other th uh, variable that we need is we need the damping constant, or the damping factor in this case, and the damping factor is 240 as given. Right, so now we can set everything up into our second order differential. Now remember, we have our function... Um, x double prime plus beta over m x prime plus k over m x equals zero. And we just substitute everything. We hope it works out nicely. So beta we said was 240 over 12. So that should work out really nicely. And then 1152 for k over 12 x is going to be equal to zero and if we divide clearly that's this one's going to be 20 so we get x double prime plus 20 x prime and I have to use my calculator for this one um, probably going to be close to 100 so like 95 90 something let's see 96 all right and so now we just have a really nice second order homogeneous differential, which means that now we can go ahead and convert this into a characteristic or auxiliary equation. And we can factor this one really nicely. Um, 96 is 12 times eight, I believe, and that just equals our 20 in the middle. Um, if I'm wrong, then I have to re-record the video. So factors into m plus 12, m plus 8 equals 0. And then we get a case 1 where m1 is negative 12 and m2 is negative 8. And so we end up with a general solution at x at t is going to be equal to c1e to the minus 12t 
plus C2e to the minus 8t. And of course we need to go through and solve for C1 and C2. So that means we're going to have to go back up and we're going to have to get some initial conditions. One that's really easy is that we have a downward velocity of 10 feet per second. So that means that x prime at 0 is going to be equal to positive 10 because we're going downward. And remember that this doesn't start at equilibrium. Okay, so remember when somebody sits on it, or the person sits on it, the suspension compresses by a third of a foot below equilibrium. All right, so essentially, let's say that this is where the, um, we sit on it, and then the compression is going to be below equilibrium. So this might be the point right here. And so that means that x at 0 is going to be a third. All right, and remember, a th um, positive because we're below equilibrium. All right, so now we can go through, find the derivative, use our initial conditions. So x prime at t is going to be minus 12c1 e to the minus 12t minus 8c2 e to the minus 8t. And then we can just set up our system, um, which is really nice about 0 is that all of the e's are going to go away when we substitute 0 in. Okay, so we're going to plug in the conditions. And when we plug in the conditions, we're going to get 1 third and 10. And then we're going to get C1 plus C2, because the E's are going to go away. And then negative 12 C1 minus 8 C2. Um, and what we can do is we can multiply the first equation by 8 or even 12 if we wanted to. So let's multiply this by, we'll just do 12, since 12 thirds is a lot nicer to work with than 10 thirds. So if we multiply by 12, we're going to get that 4 equals 12c1 plus 12c2. And we're going to get that 10 is equal to negative 12c1 minus 8c2. And this is going to work out really nicely. We're going to get 14 is equal to 4c2. We divide by 4 and 7 halves is equal to c2. And then we can just back substitute. Let's just substitute back in right up here. So we get that 1 third is going to be equal to c1 plus 7 halves. Um, it looks like we're going to end up with negative 19 sixths, I believe. But let me verify using the calculator. And yes, it's negative 19 sixths. And so finally we get our equation of motion, and our equation of motion x of t is going to be equal to negative 19 6 times e to the minus 12 t plus 7 halves e to the minus 8 t. Alright, so that's our equation of motion. Alright, I'm just making sure that there was nothing else to do for that one. Yep. So we find the equation of motion for the suspension at time t. And the question is, well, what does this mean to us? So, like for instance, if I'm the manufacturer of the suspension, I'd like to see what the eventual long-term behavior of this, or we're going to eventually call that the steady state um, solution to this sort of thing. So let's see what it looks like. We're just going to insert a picture. I graphed it beforehand. Um, and that's what the graph looks like, hopefully. All right. um, let me cut that and go back up so we can compare it to the actual solution. All right, here it is. All right, so let's paste this. All right. And so how do we interpret the graph of this? Well, a couple things we can say is that it's probably going to reach its optimal point, And we could very easily solve for this by setting x of t equal to 0. Um, but if we did that, we could see that somewhere between point 0.2 and point 0.3, it's going to pass back through equilibrium. All right, so what can we say about this? Well, somewhere right here. 
Um, it's going to pass through equilibrium at about 0.25 seconds. So basically it's going to bounce, it's going to pull down, and then a quarter of a second later it's going to bounce back up. Um, the optimal point looks like it's going to be somewhere, maybe right about here, between 0.3 and 0.4. So the optimal um, distance, or actually displacement, is when T is somewhere in the interval from 0.3 to 0.4. And again, we could find the derivative, just like we did in the previous problem, and then we could solve for the der when the derivative is equal to zero. One other thing that we notice is that it's non-oscillatory. Right? So if I was to also describe the motion of this, it is non-oscillatory. Right? And then one last thing that we say is that probably around, somewhere around like 0.9 or 1 second, from the graph, it looks like it's basically going to go back down or it's going to settle into its equilibrium. So it takes about one second to go back to equilibrium. So it might like rattle up, okay, so it's going to go up and then it's going to come down slowly from that equilibrium and eventually um, it's going to just return to its initial state where it's level with the frame of the motorcycle, okay? So um, pretty cool type of problem um, for those of you that are interested in working on cars or um, interested in the mechanical vibrations of the spring. This illustrates um, what type of motion that would go on with this sort of um with this sort of structure, this sort of system. And of course, we can extend this to not just vehicles, but anything that utilizes some sort of spring um, or mechanical vibrations. Right. So in the next video, we're going to take a look at what happens when we have some sort of forced motion, um, as opposed to just um, having a drag constant. There's going to be an external driver that's operating on our system.